Hello, good morning everyone. Um, I'm Kevin. I'm the worship leader here at Sycamore Creek Church. Um, I have my daughters with me, Addie and Naomi, and we are going to do a song for you. Um, we're starting a new series this week called Long Story Short, where we are covering or beginning the process of covering very quickly the entire New Testament. Um, we have opportunity through small groups to read the New Testament together. It's, it's a really cool thing that we're doing as a church this fall. And we're starting out talking about creation is a big theme in both Old Testament and the New, and uh, we're, we're going to kick things off with a song called Creation Song. This might be a new one for a lot of folks, but it's simple, and uh, I think it's it's pretty fitting for our service. It's based on our series. It's based on Psalm 104, so let's sing this together. Wraps himself with a garment spreads out the heavens walks on the wings of the wind sends forth the springs from the valleys flows between mountains birds of the air dwell by the waters lifting their voices in song send it over to Mark now. Grace and peace be with you. 
Good morning, my name is Mark. I'm the pastor at Sycamore Creek in Potterville. Welcome to our online worship service today. We're beginning a new series today called Long Story Short. We're going to summarize the whole Bible in six messages. Yes, that's right, the whole Bible. And we're going to start today with talking about creation. And so as we get ready to talk about creation today, I thought what better setting for us than for me to record at Lake Alliance Park here in Potterville. A beautiful reminder of the beauty of God's creation. At this time in the worship service, I ask that you get your candle out. Uh, get your candle. Get that candle lit. It's a reminder to us of Christ's presence with us as we gather to worship. I'm getting my candle lit. It's a windy day here, and we'll see whether I can keep this thing lit after I get it. Oh, there we go. I got it going. That's great. That candle is a reminder to us that Whatever we might be going through, whatever we might be experiencing, as we gather today to worship, God is with us. As we gather together online in our homes, God is with us. As I'm outside today in Lake Alliance Park, God is with us. Uh, may you know that God is with you this morning as you worship. Whatever you are going through, God's presence is there with you. And may that candle be a reminder to that truth that God is with you. At this time we're going to pray. I would invite you to, if you have a prayer request or praise that you'd like to share, to email prayers at sycamorecreekchurch.org. We have a team of people who would love to pray with those things. We're going to be praying today for the start of our series and for the ways that we might encounter God through his word through our New Testament challenge, which also kicks off today. But will you join me in prayer. God, we thank you for the beauty of your creation. We thank you for the amazing world that we see around us. God, we pray your blessing upon our reading of the Bible. Uh, as we engage in this series, God, may we learn about your word even better. May we learn about you even better. And may we grow through that in our love of you and our love of others. God, lead and guide us as we read together through the New Testament over these next 10 weeks. May your spirit be present in us and help to illuminate the truth that you would have us learn from your word. God, we pray for these series of messages that we're beginning today and that, that through them we might better know you. We might be able to better share you and your love with others. God, we thank you for scripture. We thank you for how it illuminates our lives, how it gives us guidance and direction, and how it draws us closer to you. We pray that that might happen through this series. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm going to invite you to join me in prayer, uh, in the Lord's Prayer, the prayer that Jesus taught us. Will you join me in that prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Here are our hosts for this morning. Welcome to Sycamore Creek Church. My name is Adelaide. My name is Drew. My name is Kate. And I'm Naomi. We are your hosts for this morning. Please make sure to fill out our digital connection card, which can be found in the comments down below. Please feel free to chat and interact in the comments during the service. Share worship with friends by creating a watch party. Check in on all your social media sites and post that couch selfie using the hashtag CouchChurch. The message begins with this. I kind of like to put together puzzles, but my wife, Jana, she's a master when it comes to puzzles. And when the pandemic hit in March, we realized we were going to need things to do at home. We had all this time at home. What are we going to do? we started doing puzzles and in particular Jana really got into puzzles now we went out and we stocked up on puzzles at the start of the pandemic but as the pandemic went on into April and then into May we 
we ran out of puzzles. So what did we do? We, we traded puzzles with different people. We did a puzzle swap so that we could continue to puzzle. That's our verb for when we puzzle. We, we puzzle together. Now Jana is our primary puzzle, but Drew joined in some, Kate joined in some, I joined in some, and we did puzzles together throughout the pandemic. Now when you puzzle, there's strategy involved, right? You got to figure out the best way to approach it. Now we are, we're a family. We always start with the edge pieces. We find all the edge pieces. We get all the edges in place and then we work our way in. Now sometimes we work our way in sections and sometimes as we work our way in sections, we'll, we'll, we'll say we'll look for all the sky pieces that are blue or we'll look for all the woods pieces that are green or uh, certain houses or different structures that we might see in the puzzle. Now one of the keys for puzzle strategy is it is so much easier to do a puzzle when you can see the whole thing, right? If you're gonna do a puzzle, looking at the box and being able to see the whole picture, wow, does that ever make a huge difference, right? It makes a huge difference to be able to see the whole picture. You see, it's so easy to get caught up in the individual puzzle pieces in these individual puzzle pieces that you miss out on the whole thing, the whole picture of what's in front of you. Today we're starting a new series of messages and in this new series of messages is to give us a big picture of what's in this book, the, the Bible, which is really a, a book of books. You see, for many people, their relationship with the Bible is a little like the experience of jigsaw puzzles and that we've looked at an isolated piece or two stories of the Bible, maybe a key verse, but we never quite figure out how it all fits together. We do a great job with Bible stories in our children's ministry, Kids Creek. Uh, what we try to do then in junior high when kids move on to Teen Fuel is to begin to put together the bigger picture, uh, to begin to take these puzzle pieces and begin to put them together into something that, that's a whole, a complete now, if you take a look at the Bible and if you just look at these isolated puzzle pieces, it's really difficult to make sense of it. Now, some lines can even seem a little bit funny if we, we take Bible verses out of context. Uh, I tried to use this verse with Jana when we were dating. Didn't work. Greet one another with a holy kiss. That's from 2 Corinthians. It didn't work, even though I tried. Uh, there's a, a verse that we could also use for justification for how much we've eaten throughout the pandemic. and you know, developing a little bit of a love handle, so to speak, as we gain some weight. And that is Leviticus 3 says, all the fat belongs to the Lord. All the fat belongs to the Lord. Did you know that was in the Bible? <laughs> now, as my hair turns more gray, and uh, it's definitely turned more gray since becoming a pastor. I don't know whether that's getting older or if that's being a pastor, but the, the graying has happened. I'm I'm assured, though, because Proverbs says the splendor of old men is their gray hair. The splendor of old men is their gray hair. Now, we can joke around a bit about these puzzle pieces, about these verses that we can pluck from the Bible. But there are times that this selective verse quoting, well, it's been used not for fun, but for some pretty serious harm that's been done, some horrible behavior that's happened. You see, it's a very serious thing to use these puzzle pieces to justify selfishness, to justify abuse. And there are several verses, including Ephesians 6 verse 5, that were used throughout history by slave owners to oppress people. Listen to Ephesians 6. It says, Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear. I gotta be honest with you, it, it makes my whole body ache to think of all the harm that verses like that have caused in the name of Christ. We need the whole picture. We need the whole picture. Another verse that's commonly been misused is from Ephesians 5 where it says, Wives, submit to your husbands as you do to the Lord. Ugh. There's another verse. Another verse that, that's been misused and weaponized from the Bible. Have mercy on us, O oh God. I could go on and on, not just with the verses, but with stories or parables, uh, things that have been plucked from the Bible and then misused. You see, we need more than a verse by verse view of the Bible. We need a big picture view. We need a big picture view of what is in the Bible. 
Today and over the next five weeks, we're going to take a look at the puzzle box cover of the Bible, the story of the Bible as a whole. And it's our prayer that through this series, there'd be two big goals, two big things that would happen in our lives. The first is that we pray that this series will help us to gain an understanding of the overarching story of the Bible. This series is based on a book by Joshua McNall entitled Long Story Short. Uh, Joshua is a theology professor and he has a goal to help people easily understand and be inspired by the Bible. In his book, he breaks down the Bible into six parts. I think of it a bit like binge watching a series with six seasons. These seasons are entitled Creation, Fall, Israel, Jesus, Church, and New Creation. If you'd like to get a copy of that long story short book, you can follow along each week as we move through the six big movements of the Bible. Speaking of following along, we have a second, a second big goal that we're praying that God might do in these next six weeks. We've discovered, I've discovered this through my own personal experience and through the experiences of other people, that one of the most influential practices that we can have in our Christian life is to read scripture. It's a daily engage in the Bible. And so we pray that this series helps us to engage in the Bible more. Now, uh, we're going to live that prayer out throughout this series, practically through our New Testament challenge. And we invite you to sign up to join the New Testament challenge to read through the entire New Testament in 10 weeks. We want to do all that we can to help you to dive into the beauty of the Bible. Oh, we have a reading plan that we're providing for you. You can read the New Testament on your own, or we'd love to get you involved in a small group to help provide you with encouragement, accountability, and clarity as you read the New Testament. You see, the Bible is the oldest, most verifiable book that we have about God. It's the most read, the, the most studied, the most scrutinized book of all time. The Bible is actually made up of 66 different books, written by over 40 authors over 1,500 years in two primary languages. Now, even though the people who wrote the Bible were working independently from each other, they come from different continents, cultures, walks of life. Even through all those things, the miraculous thing is the unified story of God that the Bible shares. See, the words of the Bible have shaped human history more than any other book, I would argue. Literally billions of people around the world have read the Bible. People reading the Bible have gained far more, though, than just knowledge. They've experienced a transforming encounter with God. A transforming encounter with God. Yeah. That's what we want. And now to understand the Bible, a great place to start is at the beginning. We're starting at the beginning because if you don't button up a shirt correctly, if you don't get that first button in pace... The rest aren't going to line up. It's why we always start a puzzle with my family. We're starting with the edge because we like to have the edge in place and then the rest sort of lines up. You see, if we get the beginning wrong, the story's not going to make much sense. And so today we start with a big picture by going back to the beginning to, to season one, chapter one, where the story of the Bible begins. This is the start of your story. This is the start of my story. This is the start of all of our stories. So here's the question we're going to look at today. What does the Bible say about how God created the universe? Well, in one sense, you know, the Bible is ancient literature. And it can be studied as such. Now, I have to admit, literature class, as a science guy, literature class was not my favorite class. But, so bear with me on this part. Uh, We can take the Bible and we can take the creation account and we can stack it up against other creation accounts from other cultures. And and what we can find is that there are similar themes in the Bible with other creation accounts. Now some accounts say that the world began as a result of some cosmic violence or some war. Others describe a conflict between gods and humans. And some people may look at the common themes in those creation accounts and some people do and have concluded that the Bible isn't true. That's not my conclusion. Because in Genesis 1, I think we find a very strikingly different kind of creation story. It's a story that was entrusted to a very unlikely group of people. 
You see, Genesis is different enough from any other creation account that I know how compelling those differences are. You see, there are at least two ways, two ways that Genesis begins in a unique way. First, in the Bible, we see the story of how God created the universe and how God created it complete and purposeful. God created our universe complete and purposeful. In Genesis, when you start reading the Bible, you'll notice that God creates in chapter 1 and then God does it again in chapter 2. It can be kind of confusing. We think this is because there are two accounts of the same event but from different perspectives. The first perspective is Genesis 1. And Genesis 1 is majestically poetic. It's a big picture view of God's creation. With beautiful prose and rhythm, Genesis 1 recalls the seven days that God creates the world from nothing. The name for God in this account is a one-word title of God or Elohim in the Hebrew language. It's the big picture story with world-shaping news. The second account is a little bit different. The second account is a little bit more intimate look at creation. and It reads more like a story. In, in Genesis 2, it's a story. And it's that story we're introduced to Adam and Eve. And the name for God in this second creation story is Lord God, or Yahweh Elohim. Both accounts, Genesis 1 and 2, point to how God created the universe. Both viewpoints affirm God as the creator. Each communicates truth to us about who God is, who we are, and how we are to relate to God, to others, to the creation, and to ourselves. The creation accounts in Genesis tell us that we are here not as the result of a war of gods, not as a result of some explosion of gases or atoms, and that's just it. God creates with intention. God creates a creation that is complete and that is purposeful. And we see this through a repeated declaration in Genesis chapter 1 where God saw that it was good. God saw that it was good. Now notice that word good. This is a refrain that's repeated again and again in Genesis 1. Five times God creates and then declares it's good. That's an interesting word because good here is not moral goodness. A reminder that there's nothing bad or evil yet at this time. So it's not good versus evil. I like the way that Dr. Bill Arnold talks about this. He's the director of Hebrew studies at Asbury Theological Seminary. And he says in his book entitled Genesis that the goodness implied in this verse means that it is exactly what God had in mind. It is just what God ordered, no more and no less than perfection, and completely satisfying to God in every respect good. Like an artist admiring their work, God stands back and is pleased with the results. Good means that creation is complete, lacking nothing. It's perfect. It's as if God steps back again and again during creation and says of God's masterpiece, "Ooh, yes, that is good. It's not bragging if it's true. This process reveals God's nature. You see, while human-made gods are flawed, they're power-hungry, they're jealous, they're even predatory, the Bible helps us to understand that God's nature is totally different. You see, God's creation is good because God is good. God's creation is good because God is good. God's creation is perfect because God is perfect. God's creation is complete because God is complete. We learn something in these opening verses, not only about God, but about ourselves as well. Uh, Look with me at Genesis 1, verse 26, where human beings make their grand entrance onto the stage of the creation story. God says in Genesis 1, verse 26, Let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. Now, in the time of the ancients, when those verses were written, the common myths told about creation were that the universe and humanity were to do the chores of the gods that fell beneath their dignity. But then we have the Bible. And the Bible declares that humanity was made unique and special, uh, 
above all other created life. And that we were made with a purpose to be a steward and to oversee all of God's creation. That that goes beyond some God-given to-do list. In fact, I think this points to our very being as humans. Uh, Make note of those words from Genesis 1 verse 26, in our image. In our image. Genesis tells us that all people are created in the image of God. All people. We just finished a series on politics. That means Republicans and Democrats, all people, are created in the image of God. God is big enough and mighty enough to rule this mighty universe, but small enough to live in our hearts. One way to think of this is that there's a God gene in our spiritual DNA. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, says that the image of God means that, like God, we have the capacity for reason. We have the capacity for choice. We have a responsibility for leadership and for management, and we have an ability to make moral decisions. We can discern issues of justice and mercy, right from wrong, and what is true and what's false. But most of all, when we have the image of God within us, it creates a hunger inside our soul for our relationship with God. All people are created in the image of God. And the problem is that some of us just don't know this yet. Other people might know that, but we haven't submitted to the lordship, the leadership of God in our lives. And others of us, we just simply forget this. Genesis calls us to remember the goodness of how God created us. When we say things like, I'm just a sinner, I'm being human, I have to correct you. That's bad theology. Humanity and sinfulness don't go together. Uh, To sin is to be less than human, less than the glory, less than the image of God that we were created for. Uh, We'll talk more about this, about sin and, and the effects of it next week. But for now, know that God created you. And God created every person on the planet to reflect God's good image. Now, if we look at Genesis 2, verse 15, we can see a little bit more about our purpose. The Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. Have you noticed that the story starts in a garden? In a garden. It's one of the reasons I'm outside today, enjoying being outside. If you read the story of Jesus, where does Jesus pray before his death? In a garden, the Garden of Gethsemane. And when the Bible ends, where does the Bible end? Well, in Revelation, we are told that our story will end in a renewed garden. And the imagery introduced in these first words of the Bible is going to tie the whole story, the big picture of the Bible together. You see, our assignment as humans is to tend and watch over what God has entrusted to us. It's to tend and watch over what God has entrusted to us. When you and I wake up in the morning, We have a reason and we have a purpose to live for. And we're to bring God's glory to work into our daily life. Ephesians 2 verse 10 assures us that we are God's workmanship created to do good works. Work's not a curse, it's a calling to show off the goodness of God in our world. That's our purpose, to show off God's goodness to the world around us. We are called to make powerful Jesus' name. Now, what does all this from Genesis mean? Let me share with you a pastoral word of encouragement today that everyone needs to know. You are not an accident. You are here with purpose. A good God made you in God's image. You are God-dreamed. You are God-designed. You are God-desired. You were created on purpose and for a purpose. And I'll tell you, this is true for Sycamore Creek. This is true for me. We need you. I need you. You are unique in who you are, and you are called to make a difference in this world. Go and make a difference. So what does the Bible say about the God who created the universe? Well, first, God created the universe complete and purposeful, but secondly, God created the universe from and for community from and for community 
We've really looked at Genesis 1 verse 26, but let's take another look at another part of that verse. I read it again with me out loud. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. Did you notice those words, us and our? Why did the author of Genesis use the plural to describe God's conversation? Well, Christian scholars tend to think that this is a foreshadowing of the Trinity. The followers of Jesus have affirmed that God is understood as three in one and one in three. It's a mystery that points to God's living in constant community with God's self. I'll be honest with you, no preacher has fully explained how God is one, yet also Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I'll tell you personally, I would rather believe in a God that I don't fully understand than a God that I can shrink down to the size of my finite brain. Let's abandon our need to create God in our image. And instead, let's glimpse, grab a glimpse of, of the amazing God that we have trouble grasping and understanding. You see, when we were created, we were created from community. We're created from community. But we are also created for community. For community. Look at the next verse, Genesis 1, verse 27. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. This verse tells us that both men and women, male and female, bear the image of God. But notice that the image of God is in community. Oh, when God creates, God does so in community. Community, relationships is a theme throughout the Bible. The story of Israel is a story of a community that follows God. When Jesus came, he came to a family. He had a mom and a dad and brothers and sisters. Jesus called his disciples to a new community. When the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost, they waited in community. And in Acts 2, when the Holy Spirit comes, 3,000 people were added to their number that day. I see, when God made you and when God made me, God made us to be part of a community, to be part of a family. And so the first crisis that appears in the Bible, it's not a moral one, it's not a good versus evil one, it's a community problem. Genesis 2, verse 18, the Lord God says, It is not good, it's not good, for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. Did you hear that? God is saying things are good, it's good, it's good, and then all of a sudden it's not good. What does God say that it's not good? To be alone, to be alone. God said, I did not make my best creation, my finest work to go through life alone. I made humanity to be social. Now, the Hebrew word that's translated helper is often misunderstood. It sounds like God made Eve to be uh, Adam's servant or some nonsense like that. It does not mean that. It's a hard Hebrew word to translate, uh, but it doesn't mean subordinate. It, it, it rather means like a, a perfect counterpart. It means like or across. Uh, it, it's one who comes alongside and who works with Adam. Uh, the big idea is that God made us for each other. God made us for each other. We're made to be in community. We're seeing the dangers of trying to go it alone right now in our culture and in our world. This is particularly true during the pandemic. And not that long ago, there was a huge study by Sigma uh, that pointed to what we have in our culture, uh, an epidemic of loneliness. According to the Centers for Disease Control, the suicide rate among youth has been on the rise for a while. A study that came out not that long ago from Vanderbilt University found depression rising among Gen Xers, that's people in their late 30s or early 40s. And again, not that long ago, HBO began a series that highlighted that life expectancy of Americans has started to decline. And that's largely driven by what researchers are calling deaths of despair. Those are things like drug or overdoses, uh, increased alcohol abuse, increased suicide rates. Now let, 
uh, let me pause here and say, if you need help today, we, Sycamore Creek, we are here to help you. You are not alone. And, and if you need help, reach out. Send me a private message right now during the service. Right now, send that message out. There is help and healing available for you. If you reach out and you let someone know what you're going through. You see, God's answers to all these ills is family. It is community. It is the family of God. It's one another. There are 58 times in the New Testament where the phrase one another is used. Love one another. Care for one another. Pray for one another. Exhort one another. Encourage one another. Greet one another. And on and on and on. See, God created you from community, but God created you for community. God wants you to care for others, and God wants you to be cared for by other people. A final word about puzzles. Again, I got my puzzle here on my cover. If your life today is maybe less like this complete picture, and it's more like a puzzle piece, I just want to assure you that putting together the puzzle is not something that we do on our own. It's something that we do with God's help. And we have assurance in that, putting together the puzzle through Jesus. Through Jesus. You see, the story of the Bible can be your story as well through Jesus. God created you complete. God created you with a purpose. God created you from and for community. And if you want that to be true of your life today, I'm going to invite you to pray with me and to accept Jesus, to put your trust and your faith in the God who created you through putting your trust and faith in Jesus. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you for your art, your love for us. We, we thank you for the beauty and wonder of your creation, for all the people that we see who are created in your image, and also for the wonder and the beauty and the awe of the natural world. God, today in the midst of the mess of our lives, in the midst of not knowing how to put all the puzzle pieces together, quite often we give you our lives. God, we trust in you. We follow you. We, we, we turn away. We repent of all the mistakes and the ways we've, we've, we've been selfish. And God, we pray that your love and your grace and your mercy would reign in us. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. I have a few announcements for us this morning. And the first announcement is a reminder to get connected at Sycamore Creek. Fill out that connection card. You'll see the address on the screen, www.sycamorecreekchurch.org backslash connection. Uh, get connected. And maybe you're already connected. Take a next step today. Each time you fill out a connection card, there are next steps on there. But we encourage you to continue to grow in our faith. That's how we... Do our mission as a church. We connect with God and others. We grow in the character of Christ and then we serve our church, our community, and our world. Uh, speaking of growing, one of the best ways to grow is to get connected with a small group. We are in a group link time right now, which is where we are trying to link people with a small group. And it's a perfect time to start a small group because we are at the beginning of our New Testament challenge. Our New Testament challenge, we are going to be reading through the Bible in 10 weeks. And in our small groups, we're going to be getting together to discuss what we're reading. It's a great opportunity to get on board with what everyone else is doing, reading the New Testament together, and then discussing it together in a small group. Now, to join a small group, just go to sycamorecreekchurch.org backslash small groups. You'll see a list of small groups there, and you can choose one that works for you to sign up. Take the New Testament challenge. Join a small group to help support you in doing it. Uh, a couple other things that we have going on. Uh, Sunday, October 11 is going to be a, a big day for us. We are gonna, we're going to have in-person worship inside our building again. Yes, inside our building again. Uh, it'll be Sunday morning, October 11 at 11 a.m. We'll still have our online worship service at 9.30 a.m. But at 11 a.m., we'll have an in-person, indoor worship service. As part of that worship service, uh, we're going to be uh, launching an initiative on October 11 called High Five. High Five. It's a recognition that we need to continue to reach out and share God's love with our neighbors, with our co-workers, with our community. 
they need to hear about Jesus. And we're going to help you to do that by giving you $5 bills to give to your neighbors, your friends, your coworkers, to let them know about Sycamore Creek, to give them a high five, and to give some encouragement right now in the midst of what is a difficult time for many of us across our country. Hope to see you on October 11 for the in-person worship and then to help us distribute those $5 bills to people in our community who can use them. Speaking of money, I want to thank you for your generous support of the mission of Sycamore Creek. We could not accomplish the mission of our church to ignite authentic life in Christ and fan it into an all-consuming flame without your help. You're making a difference through your giving. Again, there are a number of different ways that you can give. You'll see those highlighted on the screen. You can also give online if you go to sycamorecreekchurch.org backslash give. It's a great way to support the mission of our church. Speaking of the mission of our church, one of the ways that we impacted our community this past week is through our parking lot. Our parking lot? Yeah, that's right, our parking lot. I was contacted a couple weeks ago by the Youth Advisory Council at Potterville High School. They're interested in hosting a mobile blood drive they needed a place to host it. So where, where did this school contact? They contacted our church. Isn't that cool? And so this past Thursday, the Youth Advisory Council hosted a blood drive in the parking lot at Sycamore Creek Church. Now I want to thank you for being a church where when our schools need something, they know where they can go. They can go to Sycamore Creek Church. I want to thank you that, that we're a place that's known in our community, that we're at the center of our community, and that includes being at the center of our schools. That is our church on mission, being embedded in our community and sharing the love of God with everyone. Thank you for your support that makes things like that possible. Here is Kevin with our final worship songs. We're going to sing a couple more songs together, both songs about creation, about, about God uh, recognizing um, God as creator and really considering what that means for us, what it means to be a part of his creation. So please sing with me. Stop us, and if our God is with us, then we'll
greater My God is stronger God, you are higher than any other Our God is healer Awesome in power Our God, our God
Well, Mark talked about puzzles today. So our connect question for this week is about puzzles. Do you like puzzles or not? Um, and he has a theory that you either love them or you hate them. And I would say that's a pretty good theory, I think. But I think that I, I feel both ways. <laughs> it kind of depends. Sometimes I love it. Sometimes I get really into it. And sometimes uh, puzzles just drive me crazy and I, I want to throw them out. So anyways, you can talk about that on your uh, on our Facebook page uh, with the people you're watching with. Uh, you can also obviously talk more about creation, what that means. Have a great week. Go in peace. <laughs>